Welcome everybody to Big Blue Button World 2023. This is the keynote address. This is the kickoff. Um, my name is Fred Dixon. I am the CEO of Blindside Networks, the company that started the Big Blue Button project. I am also the co-founder of Big Blue Button Inc. In this keynote, I will be going through the roadmap uh, and kind of laying the land for how we think about the roadmap and sort of some broad perspectives on the project overall. So let's start off with a little bit of engagement. Uh, I'll just ask everybody, how long have you been using Big Blue Button? Okay. I just see the responses coming in. All right, very cool. I'm going to publish it. So uh, there are some people who have been using it over 10 years, which is awesome. And let me ask you this, what is your area of interest or your primary role? This will just help me get a sense of the, uh, the audience. I see some teachers, some students, some developers. I'm watching those results come in live in Big Blue Button. LMS administrators, instructional designers, director of online learning, and a few others. Okay. And we'll publish. And so cool. So lots of administrators, interestingly. And lots of developers, which maybe not interestingly, because this is also the developer conference. All right. Ah, yes, I could have turned on multiple selection for those, please, uh, Litia. All right, so another fun one. Uh, could you just point out where you are in the world right now? Where are you coming in from? Very cool. Lots of people from a lot around the world. I see lots of Europe. Well, everyone can see it. See some people from Africa. Very cool. All right, let me get into the meat of it. And I'm going to talk for probably about 30 minutes. And please ask questions in the chat. There are other people here in the project that will respond to you as well. And let's have some fun. I'm going to share lots of information about the project, sort of where we are and where we're going. So uh, Blindside Networks, uh, we started the project in 2007. And since then, uh, we have hosted over 2 billion minutes, that's billion with a B, of online classes in the past three years alone. And we, Big Blue Button Project is 14 years now in the making. So what is Big Blue Button? Uh, it's an open source virtual classroom and so much more. But to kind of give you the picture of Big Blue Button, let's start with the why we exist. Can anybody in the chat tell me what this picture is? Kudos to the person who can tell me what it is. Sunrays, skyline, no. Benjamin, correct. That is us. This is Voyager in 1990, uh, just before it, uh, 24 minutes before it powered down its cameras. They took a look back at our solar system and they took pictures of the planets. That's us. That is the pale dew blue dot. Um, that's all we've got. That's our planet. And so, and you turn up, talk about roadmap. Uh, this is the roadmap for the world. This is the sustainable development goals from United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO. This is our map. This is our roadmap. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well being, quality education. So it's number four. That is uh, one of the sustainable goals that we all as a country are working towards. We have work to do. There are approximately 26, 264 million kids around the world that have no access to education. That's roughly equivalent to 8% of the world's children. So picture a neighborhood that has 80 homes, 10 of those homes, there's no education, none. So I believe a lot of us here are already privileged. We have access to the internet. We're actually able to join the session. Uh, that's the world is not equal. And to get us to a better future, we've got to get education available, quality education available to everybody. So the why of Big Blue Button exists is we believe everyone in the world should have access to quality education. That's sustainability goal number four. And we do this primarily uh, or one of the key components is open source. We did not build Big Blue Button when we started in 2007 as a closed proprietary project. 
that wasn't going to get us to the goal. Uh, but by doing this in open source project, it meant anyone around the world can contribute towards it. And today we are localized into over 55 languages. So by making BigBlueButton available to everybody, we go after the goal of making, have giving everyone access to a quality education. So that kind of leads into, well, what we do. I mean, we could say we do Big Blue Button, but really we help teachers teach and learners learn. We do it online, we do it through virtual classrooms. But in general, someone came up to you and asked what Big Blue Button does or what do they do. We help teachers teach and learners learn. And we do it online. But Big Blue Button is actually more than the platform itself. There's actually about five key components that we see for Big Blue Button. Uh, it's a methodology for teaching effective virtual classes, which I will touch upon. It is the platform, the software itself, that understands the goals of the educator and student and tries to help you reach those goals. It is a deep integration with learning management systems. It, the virtual classroom does not occur in isolation, it occurs in context. It is a roadmap based on applied pedagogical theory, which I will touch on as well. And it's a global community that is accelerating towards that roadmap. And these pieces, the COC today is really on the roadmap, but they all kind of feed in towards it. The roadmap is informed and shaped by all five of these areas. In terms of just platform itself, it's always cool to check out the Big Blue Button project at GitHub and see just how many commits there have been. Over 40,000 commits in the last 14 years. Uh, the project has been forked or copied almost 6,000 times. And over 8,000 people on GitHub are actively watching the project. So this, these are very strong signs of a healthy, vibrant, open source project. The last check-in here for 2.6 was 14 hours ago. Uh, there have been there are now more people working on Big Blue Button than any ever before. We've had over 150 people commit to the project, and that is accelerating. There is a number of components in our platform. Big Blue Button is sort of the top, the pyramid. This is the one we see. But there are other components that you see in the, uh, in the project. There's green light, which is a front end. Scale light is a load balancer. Uh, these have presentations at the World Conference. Uh, a member of our community maintains a Docker version of Big Blue Button. There's the installer to help you install. And there's also an LTI. Uh, component so that if it, if there isn't a native integration for an LMS, you can use an LTI integration, and it's really good. And there's other there's going to be another talk on that as well. In terms of the global community, there are some large groups behind Big Blue Button. The French Ministry of Education uses us quite heavily. That's for K twelve. France Université Numérique, the Fun or Higher Ed, and also ZKI, which is a consortium of German universities. Uh, all three of these organizations are actively contributing towards accelerating the improvement of Big Blue Button along its roadmap. There's an example from the French government site. Uh, they use Big Blue Button as the state webinar system in addition to using it for teaching and learning. And in terms of the project, we focused on distance education. We are built into the core of Canvas. We are built into the core of Schoology. This is not LTI, this is code in the core. We're built into the core of Moodle. We're built into the core of Sakai, Shamilio, Populi, Genzabar, and others. And so this reflects that other industry-leading learning management systems have chosen to build Big Blue Button into the core of their code base and make it available by default to their community. In particular, if you download Moodle, it, the core integration, uh, which we worked over 10 years on, is now in the core of Moodle itself. There are, in the uh, community, there are a number of companies that are listed on the Big Blue Button website that have been actively contributing to Big Blue Button over the years. Uh, and any one of those, uh, you can reach out for help with using Big Blue Button. You can think of it as commercial open source. We treat Big Blue Button like a product, and we release it like a product. We also get together for developer summits. So this was in Germany in November. That was very fun. And this was the recent one we had in Brazil, the 17th developer summit over the time. And we had a lot of fun there as well, accelerating. A lot of the people there, you'll see them present in the next three days. Okay, so uh, let me ask a multiple choice question. Uh, what is Big Blue Button? You can choose multiple options. Choose, which, choose the options you think it applies to.
this is me engaging the audience, so make it more active. Uh, I could phrase it as like, what do you think is more than not? Uh, but you probably pick up, it's a question that, it's actually all of these. But uh, actually, I'm seeing something interesting in terms of what people think. Okay, so it's definitely uh, a platform and it's a methodology uh, and it's a deep integration, which I went through and it's the roadmap, sort of our guide and it's the global community. So it is all five of those, but it's kind of keen to see which one people chose. All right, so I could just launch in right now and tell you about all the features we're working on, but there's a reason why we're working on these features. And I think it's really important to understand uh, because uh, the roadmap is something we think a lot about. And the roadmap is based on what are the goals we're trying to achieve. So one first place to start it is, well, what is the road we're driving on? Like, what's the world around us look like for online learning? And we now live in a world where virtual classrooms are mainstream. They, um, they're, because of COVID, I mean, pretty much every school has done virtual classes. Uh, but the virtual classes have changed over the years. So if you go way back, for those of you, if you are tried to do virtual classes in the 1990s, you probably did broadcast lecture TV. In the 2000s, the learning management system started coming out and you kind of did things online. It wasn't synchronous, but I mean, it wasn't physically attending classes. Video conferencing system became more accessible and prevalent by 2010s. Uh, we had this really strange time, the emergency remote teaching in 2020, 2022. That didn't work out so well. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we believe that the future of virtual classrooms are not a video centric, but a pedagogic centric. So this was something that came out recently in the United States. They called the nation's report card. And they looked at uh, how the test scores were done from kids compared to 2020 and 2023 in mathematics and reading. And across the board, the scores were down. It really, uh, students took uh, it was very difficult during COVID. And that is telling us a lot of things about uh, what was virtual classrooms online and what they need to be. So it really boils down to this diagram. The underlying problem uh, with COVID in a lot of virtual classrooms, if you're looking for the optimal results, well, you're using a video conferencing system and the goal of the video conferencing system is to meet. But in a virtual classroom, the goal is not to meet, it is to learn. Uh, in a virtual classroom, you have the educator, the teacher, the instructor, the professor. They have degrees and they, are, they have gone to training to teach online. So the requirements for what they do is much more than the meeting. Um, and I kind of think of the analogy like this. If you are thinking about biking, uh, if you are to meet, you're using like a road bike it'll get you from point A to point B. But if you are teaching classes, there are things that you need to do that uh, you need to do differently than a virtual video conferencing system. And so if you were going off road with a bike, you would not choose a road bike. You would choose a bike that understands this is what I need to do off road, suspension, um, design, like more gears and so on. So uh, this, a lot of teachers struggled uh, during COVID and a lot of students struggled because the platform they did didn't really encompass. It had, when you when you share your audio video on your screen, uh, the platform has no idea what you're trying to do. It's just sharing media. Everything else is on you, the teacher and the student. And that's challenging. So if we wanna figure out like, how do we measure success of this? Really it's measurable learning outcomes. That's what that nation report card showed. And so if you think about the educator's point of view, what's the challenges? You've got two choices. You work within the limits of the video conferencing system. I will share my screen and I hope you guys follow me along. Or you attempt to augment those limits with third-party tools. Uh, I'm gonna need you to log into this website and this other website, because we're just going to try to get some engagement going here so to foster learning. Neither of these are great choices. And the student challenges as well, like building relationships that foster learning. Uh, you have an unstructured environment. You largely doing passive learning. And look, I think it's worthwhile just acknowledging it's really hard to keep focused, especially in a world dominated by social media that's optimized for your attention, not for learning. Facebook does not care if you learn. It just wants you to stay on Facebook and pick any other social media. So this challenge of learning is compounded by there's just 
a lot of things vying for students' time. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it around and I'm gonna ask you guys a question. Imagine you're designing a world-class online school, okay? And how would you ensure that the classes, the virtual classes in that school are going to be effective? Give me one thing that you would do to ensure that the virtual classes are going to be effective. So I'm looking for a couple of responses in the chat. And again, this is me. I'd like to get your thoughts before I go on to the next step in terms of like how we think about effective virtual classes and how that guides our roadmap. Okay. Highly interactive, ask questions, evaluate learning and results, engagement, webcams, which are good for building relationships user engagement, interactive. I'm going to I'm going to linger on this for a moment, like at least a minute. So take a moment. Give a put your thoughts into the discussion. Engage students with interactive sessions. Reverse a rich portfolio of methods allow teachers to connect to all participants. More student talk time. Good. Active discussions. Yes. Okay. So it, it's complex, right? There's a lot of things that have to go on uh, in a class. And there's a lot of complex things that complex things that have to go on when you teach and learn. So um, an effective virtual classroom is not just having the teacher talk for 60 minutes and the students learn. It's tantamount to just watching the recording. It's passive learning. It's just not work. If it if that worked, the test scores for the nation's report card. Uh, United States would have been different, but they're not. Um, and so if we do the same things in the future, we may not really expect to have much of a difference. And Big Blue Button, we really want to make a difference. We really want the teaching and learning occurring online to be quality education. So uh, if we think about this, I mean, there's really two people in a virtual class. Uh, there's the educator and the student. I use educator as teachers, students, teachers, professors, instructors, and so on. And really their goals are to teach and the educators to teach and the students to learn. So uh, we don't have to imagine what that means. Uh, there's 50 years and more of pedagogy that's looking at what are the practices of effective teaching and learning. So in designing a more effective virtual classroom, or providing one for the world, we're not trying to create new ideas. We're really trying to understand uh, what is the theory, the pedagogical theory behind it. And I, I talked about two definitions of pedagogy, uh, the science of education or the study of knowledge and how skills are exchanged in an educational context. The goal of a virtual classroom is not to meet, it is to learn. And I like the second one, the ultimate goal of pedagogy is to foster effective learning to help students become independent and lifelong learnings. And that goes back to, I think, to the United or UNESCO. We need educated, skeptical, curious, critical uh, learners in the world to help improve the world for everybody, make the world a better place. Okay, so we measure in terms of learning outcomes. Well, it's a good question to ask, and I'm gonna talk about pedagogy for a moment because it does underpin what we do. What does it mean to learn? Well, okay. Um, our brains are not computers. Like if they were, you could watch three hours of YouTube videos on basic Spanish and walk out and start speaking basic Spanish. They're not. Um, they're made up of 850 billion neurons, uh, which are connected uh, by axioms, uh, hooked on by synapses. And it's this huge, huge neural network in our brain. And there's actually a whole science around educational neuroscience that looks at our brain and what happens when we learn. A few things like there's a concept of neuroplasticity, which allows us to adapt and learn new things. Uh, long term potentiation, which basically says repeated activation leads to increased signal transmission between newer neurons. You do things often and more and more, uh, increase the signal. And then there's chemical changes, such as increased neurotransmitters, neuromodulators that occur uh, during learning and increased synaptic strength. Okay, so this was not meant to be a course in brain science. But what I hope you get out of this is that we're not computers and our brains are biological. And there's a good analogy where learning is like a physical workout. It's not perfect, but it's actually really good. You know, if you say like in a gym, you want to grow your muscles, well, no pain, no gain, right? You 
can't walk into a gym and watch videos on working out. You actually have to pick up the weights and work out. Your body, your muscles respond. With learning, you can't passively watch something and expect to learn. Uh, the analogy I always think about is, think of a time you've gone to a movie, you watched two hours of the movie, you went out with friends, and then you wanted to tell your friend, hey, I thought the, the daughter of the main character was really good, but you can't remember her name, right? You were just watching, but you weren't really learning. Um, learning takes effort and effort is good. It's how our brain learns. So this leads us into a certain direction for what is an effective virtual classroom. And that means like, what does it mean to learn effectively? And how can we do this? Okay, so I'm gonna bring up another question. So what is this diagram? Can anyone tell me what this diagram is? It's very famous in pedagogy. Okay. Yes, yes, I see the responses coming in. This is really positive. Okay. Uh, very good, all the different responses. Okay. So uh, this is Bloom's taxonomy and it is a theory of learning. It's not the theory of learning. And again, there's some simplification going on here because there's many ways of looking at it, but look, um, this actually says a few important things. This is like this is like 50 years. Um, we can remember and understand things. And then to get to the ability to create, which is mastery, you got to go through the ability to apply what you're doing, assess it, and evaluate it. And we call this the apply zone. You cannot get to mastery unless you start applying what you're doing. Your muscles won't grow unless you pick up a weight. Your brain doesn't learn unless you do things. And you can think of like learning workouts if you're climbing Bloom's staircase, you know, you're gonna do it over successive study periods, virtual classes, uh, workouts, call it learning workouts. And over time, you start to master the skill. You start to understand, you start to be able to apply it, like working out. So I'm gonna switch over to what we believe is the structure of a successful virtual class. And again, it's another component of the roadmap. So we believe this is based on a lot of interaction with teachers and watching how other people teach online effectively. There's always some part of the beginning of the class to strengthen relationships. In a virtual class, you're kind of like, you know, looking through a keyhole, trying to see what other people are doing. You really have to be overt. You have to set a time aside to allow students and teachers to form bonds, build relationships so that they feel comfortable engaging themselves, struggling, making mistakes. And then the rest is kind of more straightforward, but you can see the bulk of this is not webcams, it's more uh, learning and applying. So you would review as a teacher, make sure the foundations you're building on are strong. There'd be some preview, there'd be the main segments we'll talk about. There'd be a review of the class and ideally you get the students to review, again, forcing the recall, and you talk about next steps. And maybe using the last five minutes to get them working on the next assignment. Again, more apply. Within the main segment, you have topics, you break them up and our brains can focus for maybe eight, 12 minutes before we start to wander without doing anything. So what you're really doing is trying to set up small chunks and create the scaffolding on which you can get students to start applying themselves. And this gets back to the applied learning, the active learning. Each one of these gray areas, you can think of applied learning and assessment. Students are doing something, you as the instructor are assessing and giving feedback. The platform should understand this and help you do it. So uh, we have this guiding principle we think about is like the virtuous cycle of applied learning. So if you have an activity, you essentially want students to apply themselves, put forward some effort, right? This isn't passive, give feedback to the ones that are struggling and the students will learn. The cycle you're trying to get is that students realize the more I apply myself, the faster I learn. This is how you have a more effective use of your time. Coming to a class and applying yourself is going to yield a much better uh, outcome for reaching your goal as a student to learn than it is possibly watching. You're just going to spend more time and learn less. So spend less time and do more and you'll learn more. Well, you might ask, well, what's the optimal effort for learning? Uh, well, it turns out there's a theory for that too. Uh, this is the zone of proximal development by uh, Yavosky. And it basically says, you know, if you try to do something that's too easy, uh, you're not really thinking about it. If you try something that's too hard, it's not going to be very satisfying because you won't gain any understanding. But what's really interesting is in this zone of proximal development, I call it the learning zone, at the bottom end, it's what you can learn on your own. But at the top end, the optimal end is what you can optimally learn with help from others. 
whether it's peers, whether it's teachers, and then like social constructivism is here as well. So really the optimal learning is doing things with help, doing things with feedback. That's what the theory of pedagogy says. And of course it rings true, right? But it's not like, it's, it's, it's what, it's what, it's how our brains work. Okay, so really this cycle of applied learning is really getting students to do things that are in that zone, ideally near the right-hand part of it. They struggle, you as the instructor see them and give feedback, or maybe they're in breakout rooms, and they have this cycle that starts up over and over again. The platform should understand this and support the teacher and student in doing it. So this comes back to the how. This is kind of our North Star for the roadmap. In the Big Blue Button project, when we look at things that we're building out in the product, we come back and ask ourselves, is this helping to maximize the time? So we're saving the instructor time, we're making things more efficient for the students to apply themselves, applied learning, and have opportunities to get feedback. The more we can do this, the more effective the virtual class is going to be, the more you'll see learning outcomes, and the more you'll end up result of uh, students and teachers reaching their goals. So this is our North Star, and it's from this that I'm gonna transition to the roadmap. Uh, but we'll do something fun first. So which of these is not a learning theory on which we have built upon? Okay, it's looking good. I think everybody pretty much got that we did not build upon the theory of passive learning. That's not part of what we want. We want to do things that are uh, avoid the problems of, of what you see in video conferencing systems, but also have a theory of the case, have a guiding principle to say, well, what is we should do? It's not sufficient to just not do what others do. It's we got to really understand what it is we want to do and what is guiding us towards it. Okay, so I wanna come up with a few things today. I'll take that diagram, the virtuous cycle of applied learning, and this is how Big Blue Button starts to fit in. So the things that you see in Big Blue Button, the breakout rooms, the multi-user whiteboard, the smart slides, uh, all of these have been designed to make it easy for the instructor to create space to have students apply. You don't have to go to a third-party product, it's built in. And when you use these built-in capabilities, uh, what we're doing is we're generating analytics. And these analytics are visible to you, the instructor, teacher, educator, as the learning analytics dashboard. The way we say it is that there is no back of the classroom. You are not dependent upon webcams to understand if a student is struggling or not. You have them do activities in Big Blue Button and we'll tell you what the what's the results of those activities, the analytics, and those analytics are first order approximation if the students are struggling or not. Certainly if they're not responding to polls or if they're responding incorrectly, or they're not participating, that's a warning sign that they may not be learning. So uh, we try to help the instructor in this. And I'll give you a couple of visuals. And for those of you that are familiar with Big Blue Button, this is what we do today. Uh, I've been doing this for a while in this, in this presentation now. I've been turning on multi-user whiteboard. And when I do this, we can all move the mouse around, right? It's a form of visual assessment. This is what we did at the beginning to uh, see how, uh, which parts of the world we live in. And I can also turn it off as well. I can also uh, do where uh, I can lock so that other users can't see the cursor. So if I turn on, um, if I turn on the cursors again, can I ask everybody to point to the button to turn on multi-user whiteboard? You can't see where everyone else is pointing to, but I visually can see if everybody is pointing at the right place. Again, as the instructor, it's another very powerful way to assess if students are learning. We built that in directly based on feedback from educators. Breakout rooms are there where we can create content now and bring them back to the main room, really effective. So you not only put students in the breakout rooms to learn from each other and, and apply themselves, social constructivism, but you get them to come back and present as well. And the Big Blue Button will bring the content back for you. The Learning Analytics Dashboard is a live dashboard that you can open up in another tab, uh, another browser tab, and it will keep track of who is in the class. So you don't have to wonder, okay, I see, there are 50 students in the class. Are there anybody here who just kind of slipped in and one minute ago to try to you know, get a credit? You can see, it'll tell you how long each student's been there. It'll also tell you some of the activities like talk time, webcam time, and some of the activities they do in the session. You can actually get a timeline view. So if there was a particular slide that students raised their hand, you don't have to remember it. Big Blue Button knows it, it'll, it'll tell you. 
again, trying to offload some cognitive load off the teacher because Big Blue Button is really trying to understand and help what you're trying to do. And the other is the polls. So the polls give you a sense of formative assessment and Big Blue Button will keep track of all the poll answers for you during the session. You don't have to remember uh, if you have uh, some polls that you've done, you can always refer back and see what the results are. And obviously if you order and organize it by the responses, if you see students who are not responding, again, it's an indication that may be struggling. Reaching out to them for a moment, giving them a little bit of feedback, tells the student the teacher is aware of me and cares about me, which probably was really hard to do in COVID when you just had webcams to rely on and students largely didn't share their webcams. The teacher's teaching the screen, hoping that students learn. We don't wanna do that. We want you to be able to teach students directly, uh, get them to apply and give feedback in the moment. Okay, so a lot of a lot of sort of scaffolding and framework that I've laid in terms of how we're thinking about the future and what guides us. So let me talk about some uh, upcoming roadmap. So we have two releases of Big Blue Button coming up, and the uh, 2.7 and the 2.8. What we did in the 2.6 release, we built in TL Draw, the whiteboard, which you've been using here. It's fantastic, but it took us quite a good chunk of time to do it. But we were invested in doing it because we believed we could build a world-class whiteboard in the Big Blue Button. We opened up new avenues for more engagement and more feedback. So what we're shifting to is trying to do smaller releases that iterate more quickly. So you'll see uh, 2.6 came out in April. Uh, we're gunning to have 2.7, uh, uh, working towards getting out in August, and 2.8 in December. Again, if something doesn't need a release, it can always go to the next release. It's not, they're not long apart. But we think our community and is gonna be served by smaller, more frequent releases than longer releases at uh, like every year long. All right, for 2.7, there are a couple of things that we do to maximize the time, help the instructor, and to give feedback. So you'll see a grid layout. This is, makes it easy for you to put students into a grid format. It's very familiar. You can see them all into one uh, area. This is usually a good point uh, at the beginning of the session when you're building up the relationships. Timer stopwatch, assign the webcam to the presentation area. If you have hybrid class and you have high definition webcam, and a much requested feature is the reactions. So grid mode will look like this. Uh, if you're not sharing a webcam, there'll be an avatar and you can see who's muted and unmuted. Very familiar layout. Uh, there will be a timer. In, there's now a timer and stopwatch. Uh, so you can, if you want to have an activity during the live class, you can set a time for it, either a stopwatch to count up or a timer to count down. And the reaction bar. So this is what the reaction bar currently looks like. Uh, and they, uh, you'll be able to have students the thinking is that we'll be able to tell students, okay, turn on your reaction bar. And this will be visible. And as you as you give your session, students can just click at any point. And uh, you will already see this in the alpha in 2.7, which the beta is coming out shortly. Again, we want to get it out in August. And we will be building on top of this. But uh, we want to make it very visual for students. There, uh, looking ahead to the December release, uh, a lot of it is going to be on the whiteboard. Uh, we are incorporating TL Draw 2.0 into Big Blue Button, and that's going to make it possible for us to do something we call infinite whiteboard, where there will be another mode of uh, the presentation mode. So you can upload slides, you can share, you can put a webcam into the presentation, you can share a video, you can use it for shared notes, or you could have an infinite whiteboard. And again, TL Draw 2.0, awesome project. Steve Roots, the uh, founder of TL Draw, will be speaking tomorrow and talking about his roadmap for 2.0 and beyond. But think of it this way because we built TL Draw into the core of Big Blue Button, we get to benefit from all the work that the project does to improve whiteboards. So we free up our time to work on other areas, but we build on top of and leverage what Steve and his project has done. And just a visual here this is an early build of TL Draw 2.0, this concept where you have a more in the um, the infinite whiteboard, you could see where you are moving around, but you'll be, it's optimized even more and it lays the groundwork there be for the infinite whiteboard and whiteboard vision of which there is a presentation on this as well. It's really amazing guys. Like I'm so happy we did all the work for the whiteboard. It just means that Big Blue Button has a world-class whiteboard that is just gonna keep getting better and better. And just as other people leverage us as open source, we're leveraging TL Draw. There are some under the hood things that are going on for 2.8, all of which are really important. 
uh, we have a goal to scale Big Blue Button to 1,000 users. And to do that, we have to refactor how the client and the servers talk with each other and make it a lot more efficient. And we know how to do this, and we've been working on this for months. So there are two presentations about GraphQL, and this is going to uh, really optimize how the communication goes back and forth between the client and the server in terms of like reducing the traffic, and it simplifies the implementation of the communication as well. There is also work underway to do a plugin architecture, and I encourage you to go to that talk. Uh, this is how other projects have gone to the next level, which is they get to a point where they're a platform, of which we are, but then they make it so possible for people to put their own modules into the platform, their own plugins. This is what Moodle has built on for 20 years. So we're working to do this in Big Blue Button, which means we will provide the platform, and if there's something that people want to do that isn't done today, they can do it. Think of this as a first release, but man, it's a huge milestone for the project. Uh, XAPI, the Experience API, to integrate with other learning record stores will come in uh, December. And we're also going to do it for those geeks out there. Uh, we're moving to 2204. And uh, for what it's worth, the XAPI support, uh, this has been working with the French Ministry of Education. They've already defined the actors, and we've already done a prototype of this, and work is underway to get it into 2.8. And it's been it's supported uh, by, as well, by uh, FunMOOC. So, it's really awesome, and it's going to basically, you know, integrate with other learning uh, other learning record stores for sharing data. Okay, so um, that's two point seven, which is coming out in August. Two point eight, which we're working to get out in December, and the features that we're doing that in terms of maximizing time for applied learning and feedback and under the hood. There are things ahead that we want to do. So a lot of this is laying groundwork to make us do some of these things ahead. So uh, there are many things that we want to work on. Uh, if you look at each release that we do in Big Blue Button, there are usually hundreds, if not thousands, of pull requests go in. But I'm going to highlight some of the, the high-level ones we want to do. We want to bring analytics in from the LMS. Uh, the LMS knows about the student. We want to bring some information in to help the teacher maybe understand if there's students that are doing really well or students that are doing struggling. Like at the beginning of the class, you teacher could manually go find this information in the LMS. It seems like we can leverage these deep integrations and do better. Uh, we want to use AI to help the teacher do more formative assessment. I have some screenshots of it. Hybrid classrooms is another one, which maybe you have students physical in the class and remote. Uh, this will be touched upon in the UI presentation later today uh, by Bruno and by um, Tyler. Quizzing, which would be really good because it's another way of doing formative assessment, polling with the correct answer. Whiteboard vision, breakout vision, and something we call cone of silence. I'll talk about all of them in, uh, in the next few moments. OK, so breakout vision is what it sort of sounds like. Breakout rooms are a super effective way to get students to apply themselves, because in social constructivism, if you have to do something, uh, construct something with knowledge, your learning jumps up. And if you have to teach somebody else, like in the breakout room, or help them out, your learning jumps up even higher. But as an instructor, you would like to see what's going on in the breakout rooms. For those of you that use breakout rooms in Big Blue Button, you'll know that you can open up a breakout room in a new tab. So you as an instructor could follow, let's say, four breakout rooms. And I know of instructors that actually turn on the audio as well. The way they say it, it's a little hard in the brain, but they get to hear. Um, we've kind of learned that some of the other video conferencing systems don't let you see what goes on to breakout rooms. You just let students go and hope it works out. That's not what you want to do as a teacher, right? You want to have visibility. So we want to give you that visibility. The idea here is imagine you can see the current presentation of the breakout rooms as it's going. And then you would see, hey, this particular breakout room isn't doing anything. That's probably the one I want to jump into. The analytics, uh, we can express this as imagine the LMS uh, knows that students have not submitted the last two assignments. And when the students join the session, you as the instructor, the educator, I uh, get like a hint that says, hey, Ricardo is missing two assignments. And maybe there's even a link back to the LMS where it gets you a more detailed report on Ricardo's performance so far in the term. You don't have to do this. You could rely on Big Blue Button to just tell you if the LMS has something that wants to um, wants to indicate to you. And of course, uh, these are ideas, but there's lots of rich data there. Just make it easy for the instructor to see which students are struggling or reward which students are doing really well. OK, uh, we did a proof of concept with OpenAI's APIs. And uh, we didn't do something where it's like, let's summarize the session for the students. Because if you think about how the brain works, that's not as effective as getting the students to do something. 
um, but we want to have the teacher save as much time. So a poll could be typed in. Now, I've not been typing any polls in because Big Blue Button is reading the content of the slides that I have a poll question in. But what if I upload a slide that just has content? So let's take this example. I found a presentation on the internet uh, on the fall of Rome. And so here's a slide with content. And let's say I would like to take a moment and just see if students are picking up what I'm talking about. The content is here, but what I would like to do is like create a poll question that maybe has five choices and one of them is correct. Pretty hard for the instructor to do this on the fly. I could do it ahead of time, but the content's all there. Big Blue Button reads the slides into memory for screen readers, so we have the text. And with AI or a large language model, we could do something like this. We could give the instructor a button where the text for the slide goes back to the language model and the prompt is, you are a teacher, come up with a poll question with five choices, one of which is correct, that attests if students have comprehended what's the content in the slide. So here I come back with some uh, a, a question, five choices, one of them is correct, okay? It would take 10 seconds to generate this. I accept the poll, it populates the polling questions in Big Blue Button, so I could adjust them if I want, or I could just click start. And when I do, I switch over here to a student's view, the dialogue comes up, I am asked the question and I have to figure out the response. And of course, in Big Blue Button, the responses come in live and they are available in the Learning Analytics dashboard. So you can use AI to help you as instructor save time, to create more opportunities for formative assessment so you can give feedback to students that are struggling. This fits in, right? This is a good use of AI. All right, I wanna finish up with whiteboard vision of which we have talked about in the past, but it really does pull together a lot of the core concepts of what we believe an effective virtual classroom should work towards. And this is what we've been working towards in terms of laying the foundations as going on, going on. So I want you to imagine your instructor, you have uh, some tasks, there's two, two or three things that you want students to do, and it's gonna involve the whiteboard. It'll be something visual. And so I want you to imagine that uh, you've got three slides set up. There's three things that you want students to do. It could be, you know, solve something and enter their correct answer. It could be draw something, but it's going to cause them to apply themselves. You're going to create space for them to do, do something and then assess them. You're in a class of, let's say, 12 students or 24 or 48. How can you see which students are struggling to give them feedback, right? Maximize time for applied learning feedback. Well, if the whiteboard that students are, if you start the session, students are now using their whiteboard and filling in, say, a blank in terms of what the answer is, you should be able to see live all the whiteboards. You should be able to see some indication like our students filling in the correct answer. And there should be ordered in a way that probably says the person here in the upper left-hand corner might be struggling. There's no activity in the whiteboard or they've been answering questions incorrectly. So you've got them working for maybe eight, 10 minutes. You as instructor now have some golden time to help students who are struggling and maybe you can help three or four of them. We want to make that easy for you in Big Blue Button. We'll show you the students are doing, how they're doing on the um, on the on the activity. And if you click on one of them, we want to bring you into like a one-on-one -on -one session where suddenly you're sharing webcams with the student, audio, shared whiteboard, and everyone else just fades. You're just one-on-one -on -one time for a few moments with the student, and you give them feedback. And imagine this from the student's point of view. You know, they know that if they work hard, if they, if, they, if they try to apply themselves, they may not get it always right, but they will get feedback. And that feedback is gonna help them get to that next level of understanding. The virtuous cycle of applied learning and feedback. We wanna make that possible. And then we take it further. Well, after the session's done, that data shouldn't just disappear. It can go into the learning analytics dashboard, the live dashboard during the session. So imagine you see this and you see visuals of all the whiteboard or the results the students did. And imagine that you also get like a bird's eye view to see how did students do in that activity. And then this gives you a sense of the class learning or individual students struggling. Again, the platform should understand that the goal of the virtual classroom is not to meet it, it's to learn. And it should provide the tools built in without you requiring to do third party tools to facilitate the learning. And the learning is done through applying yourself and getting feedback. So that's our mantra. That's that's the guide that we have uh, are using for the roadmap. Uh, again, another fun. So, what's the focus of Big Blue Button? Is it on video conferencing or is it on virtual classrooms?
It can be used for video conferencing. Remember the diagram, right? Virtual classrooms does encompass video. It's good for relationships. But the goal of the class is not to meet. It is to learn. And yes, that's what our focus is, is virtual classrooms. So this is our North Star. This is what we've done. Maximize time for applied learning and feedback. And I think I'll leave with one last slide. So we exist because we believe everyone in the world should have access to quality education. What we do is help teachers teach and learners learn. And the way we do that is we try to maximize the time for applied learning and feedback during the live virtual class and make it easy for the teacher to teach and the learner to learn. And with that, I, I, I have not looked at the chat, so apologies if a, if a question went up, um, but I'll happily answer questions. And then I have 12 minutes before the next session starts. And actually, Aaron, I'm gonna ask if you haven't done already. So uh, go to the next session and open up the room so that folks can join, but um, be happy to ask. Uh, so Pritin, um, if you have a self-hosted infrastructure, please uh, engage with our community, join our mailing list, reach out to any of the companies that provide commercial support for Big Blue Button. You can get community support, you can get commercial support. All of these are available to you. Uh, Heather, will all the data from the Learning Analytics dashboard be available to statistics after the conference is ended? Uh, that's the recording format that's available from Blindside Networks. Yes, it is. Um, so that's making it the, all the data is available live during the session. We kind of went a step further to make that available, that data available to you live after the session's over. I see some people typing in questions. I'm just kind of scrolling up. What data will be able to rolled up into an admin org dashboard? So Latia, uh, I think you'll see that there are companies in the Big Blue Button ecosystems that are working on building out uh, an enterprise learning analytics dashboard so that if you are director of online learning and you are wondering what's going on in the online classes in terms of like engagement and maybe looking to correlate that with great outcomes in the LMS, we wanna make it easy for you to do that. Uh, so will it be possible in the future to have an API to get student attendance? Is that on the roadmap? That data is actually in Big Blue Button. When you a session is finished, it is stored in the events XML. Check out the BBB events gem. You can tease out that data uh, in terms of who is attending the class. And so again, uh, the information is there. Think of Big Blue Button as a platform. Uh, post the forum if you have any questions about it. Uh, is there an accredited accepted standard defined for overtaking analytic data out of LMS? I think this one is going to be very contextual. Um, we were working to provide this capability that you could take the data out. It's certainly there in the platform itself. We expect others to build upon it. And uh, it would be in the context, probably like if you're in Europe, GDPR, North America, um, whether it makes sense to take the data out or not, we leave it up. Our goal is to build the platform and to make the con these, uh, these, uh, these capabilities, uh, things that others can build upon. Uh, the learning dashboard, uh, yeah, it's not served through an API. Uh, we have we don't have one yet, and maybe we should. The API here, like during the live class, uh, you can query what's going on in the Big Blue Button session. But the way Big Blue Button is designed is there's no database of like inside of Big Blue Button. It doesn't know about scheduling. It doesn't know about reporting. It doesn't know about you know things that you plan to do tomorrow. It's just kind of handling the live session. It's usually in the context of an LMS. That's the before and after. So what would probably be better is if the data from the Learning Analytics dashboard could move back into the LMS. And that's also our goal in terms of like unified reports. The LMS gives you the asynchronous view of student participation and Big Blue Button gives you the synchronous view and you should be able to get this data together and create a unified report. By getting the data back in the LMS, you'd be able to do that within the LMS and that's one of our goals. Uh, Rob, Big Blue Button can be used on a mobile device. You, of course, have a smaller screen, but Big Blue Button is designed to be mobile first. And in that regards, it's responsive application. If you even took your Big Blue Button display right now in the browser and just made it smaller and smaller, you'll see parts of it start to uh, collapse where you can still expand, but it, it has been designed to be mobile first up front. Yeah, it, tablets are better. Phones are, are small devices, but uh,
big button is designed to be used on a, uh, on a phone or a tablet as well. It's a mobile first application. It also has a lot of work on accessibility as well. I didn't put anything in, but everything we do in each release, make sure we have the ARIA tags, the tab order, the color contrast, uh, and we have an external company audit uh, big blue button uh, for each release to make sure that we are accessible. And I think at this point we're WK 2.0 AA with some exceptions, but you'll see another audit come out probably on 2.6. We really care about accessibility. Uh, Pranam, uh, you can't get the data.json through an API, but uh, when the recording is processed, you can get that. So you may not be able to get it live, but I think you'll probably want to do something with it after the session's over. Uh, Avika, yes. Check out, in terms of the hybrid classroom, check out the session that's later today um, from Bruno and uh, Tyler on UI. So work has been underway to do hybrid classes. Can uploaded presentations be read by screen readers in a conference? Yes, Heather, exactly. If you had a screen reader right now, if you had JARs, if you're using um, uh, NVIDIA, uh, you'd be able to, or the other screen reader, uh, you'd be able to get the text right out as well. So we we have an external firm that has people go through it and make sure that you can read it and it is accessible. And they tell us where it's not accessible and we work to make it accessible. So if you're Section 508 or WK 2.0, you need to have accessible products. That's really important in the educational context. And that's what we work on. These are really good questions. I should point out that there, it's you see me as the kind of the co-founder of Big Blue Button Inc. and I do a lot of talking uh, for these presentations. But there are a lot of people behind the scenes. Just check out the check-ins in GitHub. You'll see all the people that are contributing to it, designs of it as well, testing. Check out our mailing list, which has over four thousand people now in the Big Blue Button developer mailing list, giving feedback on each release helping us improve the product, reproducing any issues so that developers can fix things and we can verify it. There's a lot of work that goes on in BigBlueButton. All right, I will, one more minute, um, and then I will thank everybody. I mean, you can move on to the next session, which I encourage you all to come, uh, which is the uh, talking about AI in education, practical uses of AI in education. We're going to kind of help kind of uh, weave through some of the um, hype around it. Uh, yep, yeah, zoom in and zoom out is there. So you can bring focus to particular sessions. In Big Blue Button, you never have to ask the students, can you see what I'm looking at? We faithfully show you exactly what the teacher sees or what you're seeing so that you can focus and bring focus to particular parts. Check out the tutorial videos. It actually shows you how to do this. But I'm, I have a mouse wheel here. and I'm just scrolling up and down. All right, everybody, uh, I'm going to stop recording. Thank you for attending. This was a great keynote, and I appreciate all the feedback that you gave.